Okay, I think oh no, I'll mute it. No, I'm still muted. Okay, that's good. So now we are going to do the chanting of the words on loving kindness. And we had a big ceremony over in Perth on Saturday evening. It was for a Mahayana group uh, from Taiwan, Buddhist Light International. And this is a charm which I did for them. And they were very happy to hear it. So here we go. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing, that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be happy, whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be happy, let none deceive another, or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding by not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Excellent. And that is obviously a very beautiful chant, you know, it's of the Metta Sutta, you know, taught by the Buddha. And it's inspiring, but it also uh, has some incredibly powerful teachings in it, like the words like, be content and easily satisfied, not proud and demanding in nature, 
Because when we do meditation, that's actually what we do. We learn how to be content and easily satisfied. Many times before I've taught one of my favorite little um, talks on YouTube, the most popular was, you know, it's over a couple of million downloads, and that was where the four ways of letting go. And that was to understand that if you want something, then you cause a lot of stress you know, in your meditation. So if you sit down, you want to be peaceful, that you want to be blissed out, you want to get rid of illnesses, you want to see the beautiful lights of like, the nimittas, or even get very deeper and you want to get enlightened. All that wanting is the, the blockage to deep meditation. So instead we learn how to be content. Because when you're content, we're not wanting anything in the whole world. And that gives a sense of peace. And if you are uh, well enough prepared, that you have peace, you don't fall asleep. Instead, your mind gets very energized. It's like there's a certain amount of energy goes into your mind. And when you're not wasting that energy by wanting things and struggling or getting disappointed and frustrated, all that energy just goes into the mind and just the contentment just builds and builds and builds. Now, one of the teachings I've often given is to remember the, the most happiest times of your life. I'm not talking about the happiness if you win a lottery or something, or you know, when you have the birth of your first child. I'm talking about something which is much more calm type of happiness, You're really content, happy, at peace with everything in the world. And to me, I remember those occasions, and they were just beautiful occasions. And they could, because they were calm, peacefulness or calm joy, they could last such a long time. And this is what happens when the mind is content. It means it doesn't want anything. It's just happy just being here. And then it's like the mind wakens up. And once it wakes up, it just the energy flows into the mindfulness. And those are those experiences, which I have described many times, of when you meditate. You know, you find, I have my eyes closed when I meditate here for the Armadale Meditation Group. I have my feet on the floor, and the feet, I can feel them, are touching the carpet. It's not a special carpet, but when your mindfulness increases because of the contentment and stillness, you can feel so much more sensations in your feet with that carpet. And after a while it feels really just quite invigorating. I'm not a mad monk, you've known me for so many years. I feel that sensation of the carpet against the soles of my feet and it becomes very delightful. And of course it's not just you know, the sensations in your body, sometimes the sights which you see in the very early years as I was a monk, I remember just doing walking meditation during the, the monsoon season in Thailand. We did the walking meditation inside the main hall because it was dry. And that walking meditation was you know, on a concrete floor which was laid by the local villagers. And that concrete floor was not smooth and it was the different sort of shades of grey on that concrete floor. But when I was walking, it was like you came to a point in your meditation, your mindfulness started to really increase, and then you started to be able to see all the incredible shapes and patterns you know, in that concrete floor. It started to, to look beautiful. And I remember as I was doing this, you have a sense of surprise and wonder I had to stop walking to stare at that little piece of concrete in front of my gaze. And as I was looking, you could see so much more in it. You know, there were just the, the contours of that rough concrete and just the way the different shades would intermingle and create this 
almost work of art. That's what I thought it was like. A work of art which I should cut out and send to the Tate Gallery or somewhere in London. And of course, it was just an ordinary piece of concrete. But once the energy had gone into your mind, the mind's mindfulness started getting so strong, it looked gorgeous. And this is one of the strange things which happens when your mindfulness starts to increase because of contentment. Whatever you see becomes very interesting and even beautiful, like works of art. And you've heard me say before that wonderful poem of William Blake, it's 1600, 1700, around that time, to see a world in a grain of sand, a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand, and eternity in an hour. And it's a beautiful sort of spiritual poem, and I'm not quite sure how he could say such things, you know, what his background was. He was an artist as well as a poet, but that, I can recognise that's what happens when your mindfulness really increases. And I don't mean through drugs, I mean just through the power of stillness. Your mindfulness increases enormously. And because it increases enormously, one of the first things it does, it gives you this beautiful power over your body. You can actually look through your body and you can tell if there's anything in that body which needs fixing up. It's just like one of these CT scans or body scans or whatever. They can go scan your body and see things which even the doctor can't see. But you can do that for yourself with this strong mindfulness. You can feel that something's not quite right in my stomach or it's not quite right in my arm. You know there's something happening there. And once you have the awareness, just of your body, powerful awareness, and you can see it very clearly, the next thing which you know, meditators do is simply with what we call trial and error. Your awareness is there, you're watching, you're aware of what's happening, and then you try a different attitude, a different position, and then you find the, or the ache or the pain or the the sense that something's not quite right disappears. It's the way you heal yourself, and the way you can create amazing health, you know, just with your mindfulness. And of course, I've told many stories about that in the past. I do often notice that the people who come on the Armadale group are usually, mostly, not all of you obviously, but most of you are my age, you're getting on in life. And so I'm sure you have aches and pains and bodily problems, just you know, like I'm susceptible to as well. But one of those wonderful times was just having food poisoning. I say a wonderful time, how can you talk about food poisoning as a wonderful experience? What was wonderful about it was you know, when I, it really hit me, I was in my cave. The cave is underground, it's in Bodhinyana Monastery, behind two doors. So it doesn't matter how much I screamed, and I did scream because there were spasms in my gut which really hurt. It was automatic. And so no one could hear me. And that's when you decided, what can you do? And I didn't like the idea of calling to the nearest telephone. It's in a monastery, the phones are a long way away. But instead, just learning how to be mindful of those spasms in my stomach and just relaxing them all. And it was one of those wonderful, weird experiences. Wonderful, because what happened? In half an hour, the spasms, which were unendurable, just got less and less and less and less and less and less and less, and less until they totally disappeared slowly, gently, just by using that powerful mindfulness and kindness, the things which you developed over all those years as a monk. And it worked really, really, really well. And after half an hour, there was, my stomach was perfect, nothing wrong with it at all. And no medications taken, 
just taking the superpower of mindfulness. So that is what happens with many of the physical problems in you. But also we can use the same method for some of the, the stress which people feel in their mind. You know, this, our world gets more and more busy and there's many, many things that sort of can bother us. Whether it's our family, our friends, economics, or what we see in the world, you know, who's actually doing anything useful in this world, the leaders we have, that seems to be what we see on the news. But then, this is like the ache or the pain in the body. Now can't we just look at that and find a way to be peaceful with it? I don't mean peaceful with it you know, every moment of the day. There are times when we have responsibilities you know, whether it's like the vote in an election or whether to fix up something which you know, is affecting us directly, whether it's a bushfire which we need to sort of quell or to make sure that burglars can't come into our house or whatever. It's not always just being 100% passive. But you know, there are times when we need a rest. We need to be able to sort of sit down and find a means so we're not worried and thinking and concerned or angry or, or craving something. We can learn how to get this beautiful sense of space and perspective. And one of the similes which I gave many years ago and I wrote in a book was a simile of going up a, a pyramid. This was in the Yucatan Peninsula over in Guatemala. In 1972, could have been, no, sorry, that was wrong. In 1968, 69, 69. And just climbing up that pyramid, not really knowing what to find at the top. And there was no one to stop me. There was, in the whole site, they only saw one other archaeologist. So it was not developed yet. It was just the site of the an ancient Mayan civilization in the middle of the Yucatan jungles in Guatemala. But as soon as I got to the top of that pyramid, I noticed it was above the tree line. It was the first time in days I could see great distances. I often say you could see to eternity in all directions with nothing between you and your view of eternity. Nothing blocking you. And secondly, when you get to the top of that pyramid, above the tree line, that was where the winds, which would uh, blow over the canopy of the jungle, you could feel them. It was really fresh air instead of the humidity down in the base of the jungle with all the trees and bushes all over the place. So it's clean air and clear view. And I thought that that's like meditation. You go deep inside and you find there's no stress in there. There's no way, but it's also clarity of your mind. And you do find, you know, after many years of, of contemplating from a point of stillness, you find that many, many times that you overreact to things. There's so much busyness that you can't see clearly. It's just normal, natural. But if you can give yourself some space, like climbing up a pyramid or going deep in meditation, you do find that when you come out afterwards, you know, your mind is not so cluttered. So you can see more clearly and you can find great solutions to some of the problems of your life, which can send some people just almost crazy. So little by little, when we do meditate, we find not only does our mindfulness increase, the body gets relaxed and healthy, and the mind gets very, very peaceful, which itself is very delightful. But you find after the meditation, your mind is clear, and the thought patterns have almost dissolved. And as they dissolve, you've got this great sense of peace and clarity. And so when another first thought does come up into your mind, you can see it without being deceived by it. 
you can actually see it and it doesn't really bother you so much. It may not be a pleasant thing, but then half of life is unpleasant and the rest of life is pleasant. We have to experience both. We know exactly what we can do, what we can't do. As I often mention, like suffering, stress, is expecting from the world something it, it can never give you. So we learn to be at peace with the world. We do try our best to try and make it a, a harmonious, comfortable, non-aggressive, non-violent world. But then you can't make that 100% total. All you can do, you can make your mind peaceful. When your mind becomes peaceful and calm, then it's almost like nothing can, can harm you. Someone asked me this question a day or two ago after the meal. They were saying it actually was yesterday. And they said, but, but Ajahn Brahm, that sometimes that life is very dangerous. What do you do when people are violent towards you? And I was looking at my life as a monk. This is now 48 years as a monk now. And of course you've been in places where violence could have happened. But you're threatened with violence. But then so nothing really hurt. And a good example of that was you know, when one day I was teaching down in Bunbury Jail and in the afternoon I had free time. So I used to go down to Bunbury Beach, in a quiet place on Bunbury, Bunbury Beach, and just cross my legs and meditate down there. It was very calm, very peaceful. And as I was meditating down there, after about 15 or 20 minutes, I remember hearing this whizzing sound past my ear. And I realized that someone was throwing stones at me. And I thought, no, I'm a monk, no need to be afraid. But then I heard another stone go past. And then somebody shouted out, get off our beach, Rajneeshi. They thought I was a member of the, the Rajneesh cult. I went, you know what to do? I thought, I'll just sit there, that's okay. I'm not gonna be afraid. And then I heard a few more stones whiz past my my head, and I realized that there were bad shots. Their aim was not good. And that kind of made me more concerned because it meant that once they would probably try to uh, throw a stone and try to miss me and by mistake hit my head. So it was dangerous. So I did get up, but not to run away. I got up, turned around and walked towards this group of young people, maybe about eight or nine of them, about 13 or 14. And as soon as I walked towards them, <laughs> they all ran away. It was a crazy thing. That why was it that I came closer to them, a much easier target, but they all ran. And I realized there's one thing, when you're not afraid, so people can't harm you. And we have to do it really honestly. And, oh, I don't know if I told this story the last time, but this is another one of those really weird stories. I'll start the meditation soon. But this one was when I was visiting my mother over in London. And I did offer to you know, do any teaching which was necessary. And one of those talks, they wanted me to give that in the... Uh, the Sri Lankan temple in Chiswick. I was very happy to go there. And this is the area where I grew up as a kid, so I knew it very well. But then I decided to go on a shortcut, and the shortcut was going past these uh, big blocks of council um, flats, which the police said were a hotbed of crime. But I grew up in the place, I should be safe enough there. But as I went walking down the street, it was Acton Lane, if anybody knows that, in the South Acton um, block of apartments. Uh, and then as I was walking down the road, I saw there was a group of 16, 17, 18 year olds 
know, the kids who had nothing to do were meeting together in the evening. I don't know what they were going to do, but they're pretty bored. And as soon as they saw me coming towards them, they started chanting, Buddha, 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 Buddha. They were trying to intimidate me. And I could have you know, turned around and gone another way, or just crossed over to the other side of the road. But I thought, no, I'm a Buddhist monk, we won't be intimidated. So I walked in that direction, same pace, towards them. And as closer I got, they started increasing the volume and also increasing the speed of the chant. Buddha, 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 Buddha. It was a dangerous situation. And I don't know whether, I don't recommend any of you to do this, but I decided to carry on walking right towards them. But then I adopted a different pose. I was still walking as usual, but then I lifted up my arms and my hands to what I thought was a Kung Fu pose. I've never trained not even one minute in Kung Fu, but I do remember seeing this TV show starring David Carradine. It was called Kung Fu. And that's what I did with my hands in a Kung Fu pose. And I walked straight towards them. <laughs> a ridiculous thing to try, but it worked. The boys, they could have punched me and beat me up so easily. They just parted and I walked right through them. And I never sort of looked back. <laughs> so that sometimes, I don't know why we could do these things, but it always seems to work. I've got some good karma somewhere. Of course, I would never hit anybody, but nevertheless, I'm just making that pose to get some respect, so they just let me carry on walking and go to the talk I was giving that night. So, the message there is when you are peaceful and you're not afraid, people can't harm you and you're safe wherever you go. So anyway, uh, that is just a little talk to get things going. We can now do a guided meditation for half an hour and after the half an hour's guided meditation, we can give a talk about something or other. Again, I, I've got a clue what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to ask for some suggestions at the end of the meditation. So, if you get yourselves comfy, however that is. And I must admit, when I was young, I always thought you had to sit cross-legged on the floor with your back straight and never move. Don't be silly like that. Be, <coughs> Oops. be kind to your body. Being kind to your body, I mean treat your body like a really nice friend. And if you are not afraid, and treat your body with kindness, be content and easily satisfied, you'll find that your body relaxes and just loves to be with you. My body is my best friend. So every time we have the opportunity to meditate, as if my body says, yes, at last, I can stop talking now. So I, I'm sitting on, on a chair. I make myself what I think is comfortable, but then I go deeper. And I start looking at parts of my body. And the first thing I look at is, again, my feet. The reason I start with my feet when I do this body sweep is that there's usually no problems down there. So it gives me a nice easy place to start this combination of awareness, appreciation and kindness. And I can feel the sensation. I, I don't like wearing socks or even shoes. So now i am just got my bare feet on this carpet. 
in Bodhinyana Monastery. It's not an expensive carpet. I can feel its, its texture. It's, it feels like an animal. And very gently just allow me to rest my feet on it. And it feels very comfortable. And my feet can relax. They feel a comfort, no stress on them. And I stay being aware of my feet, not just the soles of my feet, the whole of my feet and always just wishing it to relax, be at ease. It doesn't need to feel any stress. And I can experience now that I'm just going to adjust this position slightly by moving the toes further apart. And it feels even more comfortable. And I don't know if you do this, but when I relax, my body, starting with my feet. I usually don't leave them until they feel really at ease and comfort. There's a certain sensation which I got used to. Of feet comfort. And I can't feel any tightness, stress anywhere in my feet right now. And that feels good. It's a sensation I can discern as pleasant. And then I move up to my ankles. It's like my ankles, thanks for looking at us today because I, I was very busy this afternoon and didn't do much meditation, I've got to confess. But now I'm with my body and it's like, thank you for being with me, it says ankles to my mind. I can relax them. They feel okay, so I now move up my lower legs, checking them out. They're a little bit achy because I was doing some walking this afternoon. And I can just feel them, give them kindness. Sometimes it's like some of the animals you see in the forest. You see them there and they're a bit afraid sometimes, but you give them kindness and you can see them relaxing. These are animals in the forest. They feel safe. And it's the same attitude I'm now giving to my lower legs. So they feel safe. They can relax and be totally at ease. And then to my knees. My knees have got their own special experiences, feelings, sensations. And know this, this is, I call it knee feeling. It's different to any other feeling. Once I've contacted my knees with my mind, we've got a connection there. And I send goodwill and kindness down that line of connection. And my knees now start to feel at ease. They haven't changed their position, but something inside because I'm not giving them any stressful overreaction. They can lessen their tightness and feel nice and open and free. So that makes me pass those knees and go up to my thighs. These are just huge muscles for me. And I just wish them well, relax them, feel them, and let them also relax to the max. I can feel them easing off now. They don't need to walk or stand. They're sitting down. And they can stay like that for another 15 or 20 minutes. So you just Enjoy that rest. And then I move up to my or up to my butt. 
on the chair. Feels really comfortable today on a this nice soft office chair which you sit in. It's easy to make that feeling, just really easy. But I do care to make sure there's no folded co clothing cutting into my flesh. That everything is as easy as possible. And then I move out to my waist. The monks wear this little belt and it keeps a lot of robes on. Sometimes it's too tight, sometimes too loose. And often I just adjust it at this point. But now today it feels okay. I leave it alone. I straighten up my back because it always feels better for me. You can lean back on the chair, but how can you make your back the most comfortable it can be? This is where the trial and error come in. Once you have a connection with your mind and the back, you're aware of it. You can try this and try that. And soon after, you know, many times of meditation, you find your best position for your back. And I go down to the bottom of my torso again. And I sweep this attention just up my body. I don't really know too much what's the intestine, what's the colon, what's the gallbladder, what's this, what's that. I just move the attention up and if I find something which doesn't quite feel right, I pause. And just like with the feet, I wish it well. Imagine it something is being closed off, squashed, compressed, and imagine it opening out. If anything is too, too um, stretched, I imagine it loosening, so there's no tension anywhere in my body. Go right up my digestive tracts to my stomach, and maybe you may have eaten something this afternoon, this evening, you can feel, something you can feel, it's inside your tummy. Just wish it well. We're not trying to get rid of feelings, we're trying to make peace with them. And then I go up past my lungs, past the heart, making sure everything feels cared for and is at ease. And I get to my shoulders, it's muscles again now. And I always make sure that those muscles on either side of my spine are not stretched, not squashed, but like they're, they're loose on both ends. So there's no tightness in there at all. And after a while of being mindful of your body, you soon learn how to relax it. And now I know that this is comfortable shoulder feeling. So I can go down my arms, down the upper arms to the elbows, past the elbows to the forearms, to the wrists, and to the hands. Making sure my hands are relaxed to the max. I'm going to go up to the shoulders again, and on top of the shoulders, my neck. This is, I usually, I don't know, got into the habit of doing this, doing a little exercise with my head, moving it to the left, to the right, moving it forward, moving it back, until I can recognize the most comfortable position for my head on top of the neck. And that saves my neck from aches and pains. And lastly, 
I'm aware of the feelings around my eyes, and my nose and my mouth and the face. No I can be experiencing those feelings. No I relax them. I've learned how to do this. Being aware of those feelings, I give a little bit of kindness, relaxation, I can feel those sensations ease off. And you soon, using the feedback which awareness allows you to have, you soon learn how to relax the muscles on your own face. And then I can feel my whole body trying to relax parts of it one by one. Now I can experience the whole of my body. There are some parts I might have missed out, but if I have and they feel they need a bit more attention, I will give it now. So my whole body feels at ease. And it feels the delight of relaxation. Sometimes I have to wait for a few seconds before that delightful feeling of a body which has been mindfully and kindfully relaxed. It feels really nice. Just like when a person soaks something in a hot tub and all the tightness, the stress, the tension in the body just vanishes. I'll do that to the whole of my body just with awareness and kindness. And at this point, something I said earlier to somebody, it's a nice thing just to put some attention on the muscles around your mouth and just smile a little. Meditation is not something which you hate doing, but it's a beautiful experience, so smile and start that perception of joy. And this is where I now go into the present moment, just now. All the past and stuff which I've done earlier today, which is not finished yet, it'll have consequences later, but it's done, it's finished. I make a point of not worrying about it now, letting it go. I've done my best, couldn't do any better, so now I let it be. And I always remember that now is where my future is made. This is the only time I can do anything for my future and I know what my future often needs is some rest right now, some contentment in this moment, to bring energy to my mind, to be able to face whatever I have to do next. Now it just needs peace. And I can feel that peace now. After a while of meditation, you can be aware of some of these parts of your mind which are important, which for other people are just words, concepts. For you it's an experience. I can feel peace right now. Once I'm aware of it, I can watch it grow. Right in this moment, content, satisfied, not wanting anything in the whole world. It's nat natural. This peace gets stronger, easier to see are more powerful. And 
I also know that it helps in this present moment to be silent, not to give anything a name, not to try and remember things, but just know, know what's happening right now. Not worrying what it means, but just experiencing silently the content of the present moment. I'm going to be quiet now till the meditation finishes.
is getting close to the end of the meditation period. How do you feel right now? Has the meditation worked for you today? If so, how much peace is there inside? What does the peace feel like? And how relaxed is your body? I'm now going to ring the gong three times. Or not to ring it, but just to make it chime. When meditation, it's always like these bowls where you can just rub the piece of wood on the outside and make it resonate. That sounds much better than ding, ding, ding. Ding, ding, ding makes, it sounds a bit harsh to me. So anyway, there was the meditation. I hope you enjoyed it. Now is the opportunity to give a talk about something or to ask some questions. Who wants to ask a, a, a proposal for the talk tonight? Is Dave still there? David? Or he's disappeared? Okay, I'll just talk about something. I know that... Is it David? Oh yeah, hi. David, unmute. Uh, I, I have a question actually about free will. I've been listening to some ah. psychologists talk about the illusion uh, that, uh, of, of us having a free will and, that, and we don't. And I just wondered what your thoughts on that because it sounded, ah. sounded a bit Buddhist. <laughs> of course, it's Buddhist. But well, this is sometimes can be quite scary for people because you know, it is very deep, the idea of what actually is will. And I'm not quite sure if you saw some of the work of this Professor Libet, L-I-B-E-T. And this Professor Libet you know, actually showed, you know, proved conclusively, the what we can be aware of as our will when we decide to choose to do one thing rather than another thing. We can be aware of that. But that's not what starts this idea of like doing things. It's not part it's part of the process. It is not the beginning of the process. And that was, had a major consequences because it showed by the time you thought you decided to choose to do something, it was already happening. And a good example of that, this was you know, some of those um, experiments we did as students. You know, because at Cambridge I was part of the the Cambridge University Psychic Research Society. So, you know, we were a lot of scientists, I was a physicist. We wanted to find out about the nature of this weird stuff. And one of the things we experimented with was with hypnotism. What actually is it? Why does it work sometimes? And so what we did uh, just one example <coughs> just comes to my mind. There's one of our members here, you know, he's done a lot of hypnosis. And there's one of these gentlemen in our society, he's, you know, he's a Scot, 
but he always knew how to fly an aircraft without ever being trained. Even as a kid, a young man, he knew how to fly aircraft. And that was really weird. And then eventually, under hypnosis, you know, he recounted, and I listened to the recording of the hypnosis, he remembered you know, being a pilot in the Second World War and flying a plane from Wales to Gibraltar. It was not attacked, but it just had a fault in its design and it crashed on the landing in Gibraltar Airport. And he described you know, everything about that. He was the pilot and the emotional distress because he had many other uh, beings on that plane and he was responsible for their safety. But anyway, after I heard that, I'm not good on the computer, but I went on, I think, Amazon or Wikipedia or something, Gibraltar air crashes, Second World War, and you got the details of it. It was recorded. And I was really quite stunned that through hypnosis, this man could actually remember something which happened you know, a long time ago, which he was not aware of. So those are the sorts of things which fascinated me. And if you're going to be committed to truth, let's investigate these things. But this one particular experience which shocked me about the will was when one of the students in one of these demonstrations, they asked everybody to come up and see if you can be hypnotized. I was not a good hypnotic subject then. But this other student was, and they put him into a very good hypnosis and made him do silly things. Great entertainment. But the exercise which I thought was really strange, which gave me a lot of insight into what actually is the will, was when they asked this student in Cambridge that when the um, hypnotist would touch his right earlobe, this student would stand up and sing the British National Anthem in a full voice. And I thought, no one would ever do that. But anyway, he took him out, out of hypnosis and then a few moments later, the hypnotist touched his right earlobe. And this young student, maybe about 20 years of age, so I stood up and sang, God save the Queen, from the beginning to the end, full voice. And all the other students, we weren't respectful at all, we were laughing our heads off. It was one of the funniest things I'd ever seen. But then I stopped laughing when the hypnotist asked this man, this young student, why? Why did you decide to sing the British National Anthem at this particular point? It had no reason at all. But this student said, oh, he had a will, he made up a, a reason for, for that. To me it was quite clear that student was under the impression there was free will. He chose to sing the British National Anthem like that. Whereas to everybody we knew it wasn't free will at all. The hypnotist had told him to do that. And that worried me because it explains so much about how things like advertising works. We think we have free choice. Do you? You go into the shops to buy this or you decide to do that, but is it really free choice? And my story about that is I remember seeing on the television when I was 18 or 19 that it was an advertisement for St. Bruno Tobacco. That this ordinary looking young man was walking down the streets of some town in UK and minding his own business, everybody was ignoring him. Then he got out a pipe and put this tobacco in it and lit it. And then after a few minutes, a few seconds, all these incredibly beautiful young ladies were following him. They jumped over the counters of the green grocer, they dropped whatever they were doing in the newspaper shop, and they were following him. And the, uh, the caption at the end was, the aroma of some Bruno tobacco was irresistible. 
And of course, that's a stupid idea. But I put my hand up, I put some. And I was walking down the street in Cambridge, and the only female which followed me was a dog. <laughs> but you know, I brought into it, it was stupid. And of course, how many people actually just get convinced by the advertisements which you see? Buy this, invest in that. We think, oh, you know, just we are just too sophisticated to believe in all that. But you're not. It's just a way of conditioning or brainwashing. So I think you've known that very often I say, I'm very happy to teach you meditation, to give you talks. But what am I really doing? I am brainwashing you, but in a beautiful way. So that you can you know, be good, kind people. You have a good feeling about yourself. You're not so negative. Talk about two bad bricks in the wall. And you realize, yeah, there's two bad bricks there. There's 998 beautiful bricks in each one of you. And think, yeah, you may be damaged goods, but all the trees in the forest are all damaged, twisted and bent. And the more damaged you are, the more beautiful you are as a tree in the forest. But certainly you belong. And so all that brainwashing has a positive effect to bring you peace and happiness. And eventually enough clarity of mind that you don't need to be brainwashed anymore. You can see these things for yourself. So you now free will, you find what actually does motivate you. Why do you do what you want to do? Or do what you think you're willing to do? And a lot of times it's because all the, the people you meet and listen to and what you look at on the things like the internet or on the TV, they're the ones who condition, cause this thing which we call will. But with Professor Libet, is what he did some further um, research, and he found a, a very interesting part of the will. You don't actually will yourself to do something. So there's no such thing as free will, but you can actually stop things. You may have been conditioned in one particular way, and you can say no. And he said that's called free won't. W-O-N-T. He said that's legitimate, you can prove that exists. Restraint, letting go, not going through with it, stopping. And that is really Buddhist. There's really lovely stories about that word stop. And one of those stories, the first one, is about this person in the Buddhist scriptures called Angulimala. And he was a serial killer. Why he was killing beings is another story. But he was chasing after the Buddha to kill the Buddha. And the Buddha used some sort of psychic thing, so he couldn't catch up with the Buddha. So the serial killer running after the Buddha start, shouted out, Stop, monk! Stop! And the Buddha would uh, turned around and said, I have stopped. Why don't you stop? And that was a sort of a powerful opening for that man who was so violent. He understood it straight away. He stopped and felt some peace and some deep understanding. And the other story, uh, this is, that was in the old Buddhist texts. This is a modern story this little novice in Thailand, maybe about 10, 11, 12 years of age, I can't may have got the age wrong, but he was listening to one of Ajahn Chah's talks. And Ajahn Chah, you know, you think he's my teacher, he was a brilliant monk, and you may have read some of his teachings. But those are the ones which are filtered. You know, he talked for hours sometimes, and some of the talks were so boring. I say that out of great respect to my own teacher. And this novice was there and he said, I'm not a monk, I'm only here because I think my parents can't look after me. And he said, he started saying the same word again and again and again. 
which was when is Ajahn Chah going to stop? When is he going to stop? When is he going to stop? And this little novice, suddenly, he changed the words around. And he thought, when am I going to stop? And the novice stopped. When he opened his eyes, it was early in the morning, all the monks had left. He'd been meditating there, blissing out for hours. He'd stopped. The movement of his mind had finished. There was no wanting, no commenting. Everything went so still and peaceful. And he got into one of the deep meditations. And all the monks, they'd done their bowing, their last chance at the end of the talk. He just sat there, he was not aware at all of the world of the five senses. He'd stopped, and blissing out inside. So that's actually sometimes when we don't well, we stop. Then you get some incredible powerful states of meditation. You understand how this mind really works. So that's you now with the idea of wills. It's very powerful and so many of the psychologists and scientists have done their research and it's totally understandable. They're getting much deeper into the idea of will. But be careful because you know, the will is one of those personal possessions we're most attached to. We don't want to let other people make choices for us. And many societies will, de will defend our free will, even to the death, believing we have such a thing as free will. Anyway, any comments on that? You've got quite, I'll give you the free will to ask a question if you want. <laughs> May I ask a question? Yes. Okay, so it relates actually to what I was going to ask about uh, during meditation, because during meditation you said don't label things. Yeah. And, uh, and I did feel very peaceful and it was very interesting when we went into silence my mind is just so used to finding the breath or some other anchor. And so I was uh, just observing that, but when it comes to free will, I think it's very interesting about free won't. Yeah. You can stop yourself. You can stop yourself. Is there a specific technique in meditation to help us experience that uh, as someone who's not as experienced as you? What, what would you do um, in order like? just to try to just experience the labeling or do we try to stop it? What are your thoughts about that? Well, after a while, all those labeling, it's just too much work. So, are you a lazy woman? I like being lazy whenever I can. <laughs> a lot of times people don't allow me to be lazy. When you meditate, really get into it. If you don't have to, don't and you're exercising your free won't. You've got all the business and stuff you have to do, but I'm not going to do it, I won't do it. And then you get these beautiful, peaceful meditations. I'm struggling, I'm always like, oh, because I'm, I'm always planning, planning, planning for the most part, especially because it's morning times here, yeah. and so I'm planning for my day. And so I'm planning, 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 and therefore labeling it. But I was could step back and watch it. So, yeah. And what, what was it exactly that you just said? Tell myself what? Uh, I'm not going to do it. So yes, what was it? that's what I won't do it. <laughs> because it's because you know you're from the U.S. and you're mm -hmm. you're putting in your right to choose not to. <laughs> Choose free will. Not the yeah, free won't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Great. It's almost like tricking people, but it does work. And after a while, you know, you feel that you're just sitting there 
and you do much better in the future if you can sit in peace right now. And you have a, you know, you've got the whole day in front of you, but nevertheless the day goes so much more smoothly, peacefully, joyfully, and intuitively when you don't plan things. This is a little kind of a joke, but it's, it's a lot of truth to it. I find if I don't plan things, then things go wrong. If I do plan things, they go wrong anyway. <laughs> Whatever I do, they're going to go wrong. <laughs> so I choose to enjoy myself before they go wrong. <laughs> okay, another question from anybody? Oh, from Murray. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Ajahn. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. Great, thank you. Um, one of the things I've been hearing a lot and learning from you is, is about, um, I guess, being, being kind to the body and like, looking for those points of pain or discomfort and you know, changing it so that we're comfortable. And so I guess a lot of you know, thinking about that aspect and then also hearing a lot about people talking about that, you know, you need to exercise the body, mm. um, you know, to get some elevated mood or happiness that the body needs to be, I guess, stressed in some sort of way, you know, in a, in a, in a physical sort of way. And I'm just wondering, you know, in your experience, um, what you could say about that. Yeah, I must admit, I, I don't exercise my body that much. But I do live in the forest monastery and uh, there's very strong gradients, so it's very rare that I walk on level ground, so I do get some exercise. We always feel that even better than exercising the muscles of your body, I mean the best is to understand what stillness is, so the body can really be still and at peace and not move at all. It's weird, but there's so few people in this world who can actually keep their body perfectly still. Even when you go to sleep at night, you know, you're just tossing and turning. And even right now, if you look at people just on all those screens, how many of you are still? And this you know, is a beautiful thing, it's like preserving energy, not wasting it all the time. I think that's an interesting part of keeping physical health, which a lot of people don't understand. Because how many people can actually sit still for half an hour? Always doing something, scratching this, moving this, or squiggling here, squiggling there. To be able to sit perfectly still. One, the, my predecessor, Ajahn Jakara, who started this monastery once, uh, we managed to film him while he was meditating, and then what we did, we put it on the fast forward. You know those fast forward buttons you used to have on those video players? And we put him on fast forward, and it was just like he was on the normal speed. His body didn't move at all. I thought that was really impressive. So, you know, his body was still. And it means that, you know, whatever energy you have, you're really not wasting it. You're a very efficient machine, if you'd like to call it that way. There's another thing there that sometimes, obviously, each one of you one day will get very sick and you can't exercise. You'll be in some sort of hospital bed or something. Then what do you do? It's great for the doctors and nurses you know, to just see you there and you're just perfectly still. You're not dead, but you're just nice and still so that your body can heal quickly. And as far as your mind is concerned, in that stillness, you can get a lot of joy, a lot of happiness, a lot of understanding. Uh, a good example of that is, you know, you know one of my favourite teachings was the Emperor's Three Questions. When is the most important time? 
the only time you have is now. Who is the most important person? And the answer is the one right in front of you right now, whoever that happens to be. And if you've got no one with you, it's you in front of yourself. What's the most important thing to do is to be kind. And I use that as a meditation method. Now is the only time you have. And the most important meditation object is whatever's happening right now. So I close my eyes. And if I'm tired, tiredness is the most important object for me. If I'm restless, restlessness is. If there's aches and there's pains in the body, those pains are the most important. And what do I do with them? I make sure I don't try and get rid of anything or try and hold on to things. I care for them. It's like opening the door of my heart to whatever's happening right now with unconditional awareness. Now, people often talk about unconditional love, but I just extend that word to you know, awareness, mindfulness, unconditional awareness. It works. If there's something unpleasant going on, you learn about why it's unpleasant, and soon you know, that learning overcomes the unpleasantness. You don't overreact anymore. And often you find how there's so many things, when you're with them and you care for them, they vanish. They settle down, become peaceful. And you go into some amazing meditations, just from places which seem so unlikely. You're tired, you're exhausted, you're aching, you're pain, you're sick. And so, what are you aware of right now? And be kind to it. And then you soon get very peaceful. It's one of the ways to always remember if you do have accidents, you're in hospital, you're in pain, or you know, you're dying. It's a brilliant way to do meditation before you pass away. Now is the most important time. What am I aware of right now? Be kind to it. Don't fight it. Don't reject it. Don't hold on to it. Just care for it. This caring relaxes things so deeply. Does that make sense? Yes, thanks, thanks Is there another question just before for another five minutes? Yeah, it's a pinder, yeah. Just a comment that John brought about the uh, exercise, what Mary was talking about earlier. Yeah. I, um, if I can, I go for a walk in the mornings. Yeah. And if I'm not there, I sort of treat it as a walking meditation. Yeah, great. And because there's not too many people around, so I can't, I don't run into bicycles or other things. Yeah. softens and disappears. You know, it's like, um, you know, often it's not just in Buddhist meditation. So many people talk about letting go of the past and letting go of the future. They find it hard to do. And the beautiful way of doing that is, first of all, being kind to the past and to all the actors in that story of you and your past. 
and don't treat them, just judge them so harshly. And I don't know what you did, what other people did. You know, other people have probably done the same in the same situation, but because it was your history, sometimes we emphasize, you know, one character or many characters or oneself. So when we're kind to the past, it allows you to be able to let it go far easier. And when it's your future, you know, be kind to the future. Whatever happens to you or other people, just when they have that kindness there, if, you, know, some, you lose something and suffer a little bit, you can learn so much from that. It's all those teachings which you've heard me say, any time you have any difficulties or suffering, it's just like you tread in the dog poo. It's fertilizer for wisdom and kindness, compassion. So when you're kind to the future, you don't judge it so harshly. That too is very easy to let go of. So that kindness, when you're kind to the present moment, and no matter how you're feeling or all the burdens on you in this moment, when you're kind to them, they do feel lighter. And you don't mind staying in the present moment longer because it's fun to be here. That makes sense? Yeah. That's good. Okay, we've got another one minute left. Anyone else want to try a quick question before we finish off? I have a quick question. Okay, Gloria, yes. Uh, how to feel safe when the sense of unsafety is like feel like in your nervous system? Okay, it's not in the nervous system. It might feel like that, but often, you know, if you're on a, some, especially on a retreat with other people, or you're in your home, or you're in any, any other place, just remember a lot of times that you know, no one really wants to hurt you. And if you're a very, very kind person, people like protecting you. I don't know why people just, they, they, they look after me wherever I go. And I never sort of, I never feel unsafe. It's weird. But, you know, even going to prisons where there's people, they said, look, you know, you're a man, but we could rape you in like one minute. And the guards would never get close to you. And all these places, but I felt so safe in those prisons. I feel safe everywhere. Because you're kind to others. Your kindness is more powerful than you can ever expect. Your kindness, your gentleness, that protects you. And even, okay, I'm maybe going a bit extreme here, but it's true, there are other beings in this realm who in the name will protect you, keep you out of harm's way. So be kind, kind to all beings, and those other beings will protect you. Sometimes it's crazy, but it's true. Okay. This, I've got 8.31 now, so thank you all for coming today. I wish you all happiness and well-being. Pindy, are you going to say something? Yeah. Uh, sorry, John Brown. Uh, this is something, a uh, mini condition that Chris has started, Chris from Japan. Yeah. We, we normally end our evening with a little blessing. Okay. You want me to give the blessing? If, if, if oh, yeah. Yes, certainly. Yeah. Here we go. It's a blessing for all of you and everybody else. Sabaro go inimuto, Sabasanta pawajito, Sabawera mati gando, Niputo chatuang bawa. Sabiti o viva chantu, sabaro go vina satu mate, boan wantarayo sukiti, gayu go pawa apiwa, danhasilitsa nicha, 
Uta Pacharino Chataro Dhamma Watanti Ayuano Sukang Balang. That's a traditional blessing, wishing you all happiness, free from sickness, safety, and peace, happiness, whatever you want. Okay. Okay. See ya. That was Becky there as well. Okay. Just so that you, those of you, for, yeah, just so you all know that. Yeah, I'll be going to. Uh, uh, I'm going over to Hong Kong next week. Yes, yeah, so anyone in Hong Kong, I'll see you over there. Okay, okay. Wait, Abby and Charlie, do you want blue or red? Okay, excellent. See you all. Sleep well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good night, all. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. 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 Good night.